I will call Pete Wishart to move the motion, and I will then call the Minister to respond. There'll be, there will not be an opportunity for the member in charge to wind up, because, uh, as is the convention for 30-minute debates, it's, it's too short. Um, I'll also not uh, enable any speeches other than those of Mr Wishart and the Minister, so interventions only. OK, I call Pete Wishart. And order, order. Pete Wishart to move the motion. And thank you ever so much, Mr Hendrick, and I look forward to serving under your chairing this afternoon for this very short but hopefully important debate, and I refer to my entry in the Register of Members' Interests. When I was thinking about how I would open this debate, I, I thought we'd start with something profound and interesting, maybe like music is the sustenance and nourishment of the soul, that it's the one thing we turn to when we feel happy. It's the one thing we turn to when we're trying to escape or evade any feelings of melancholy. What we turn to when we have that special occasion, that anniversary, that time with friends, that going out in the evening. Music is absolutely everywhere, and it's there in a multiplicity of different genres. And it's a great chronicler. It's music that takes you back to that specific moment, that time in your life, that special experience, that moment. It's almost like that instant recall when a certain song comes on and you remember exactly where you were and what you were feeling in that moment. Everybody's got a favourite song. Everybody's got several favourite songs. And then I thought about, it's about musical genres, so maybe let's have a look at the sheer infinity of music that's available and the multiplicity of genres that exist everywhere around the world, how these 12 notes, 12 available notes, has fired human imagination, and how we've managed to sequence them and organise them in so many different and profound ways to create this huge catalogue of wonderful works of artistry, of songs, compositions, and beautiful sounds. But after all of that, I thought I would open this with what's probably the most profound thing anyone has ever said about music. And that is when Eric Morecambe said to Andre Previn, as he grabbed his lapels, I'm playing all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. And I thought that sums it up for me, not necessarily in the right order. Because it's, music takes you where the imagination dictates and determines. And music is, in fact, only semi-constructed, sonorous chaos, and that's the way that it should be. Now, Mr Hendrick, I've probably bored you before about telling you about my life in music. I had 16 wonderful years in the music industry playing keyboards with Rundrig, and we were lucky we had some great success as a band. But I come from what's probably the smallest genre of the small genres. I played in a Gaelic folk rock band. In fact, when I started out, we were probably the only Gaelic folk rock band in existence. Now, we were never going to get played on commercial radio or radio. And I don't think there was a great demand for Gaelic songs about medieval clan battles on Sky or cuddy fishing in the Minch. So it was to the specialist radio stations and programmes that we turned to for some sort of sense of support. And it was there. It was there on Radio Scotland. In the guise of people who championed us and backed us. People like Ian Anderson in Radio Scotland. People like Tom Ferry, like Robbie Shepherd, all providing a fantastic service. And that gave us a break. It gave us an audience to build and it helped develop and shape our career. But more than anything else, it gave us hope. Here was our songs being performed on Radio Scotland. This Gaelic folk rock band, who was never going to be the trendiest band in the world, were being, their songs were being played and it was so important to us. And we went on to become one of the top rock bands in Scotland, selling millions of albums worldwide and sustaining a great touring career. And this is what it's all about. This is what these small specialist radio programmes and stations can provide. They give the opportunity, but more than anything else, they give that hope. So why this debate and why today? Well, it's a simply appalling decision by the BBC and BBC Scotland to cancel Jazz Night's Pipeline and Classics Unwrapped. Indispensable programmes, specialist programmes that serve a distinct and particular audience. Programmes that don't really exist anywhere else for an audience to turn to in order to get services that they feel that they want and they uh, aspire to. And I don't think I've ever seen 
anything like the response to this decision to axe these three important programmes. And it's been overwhelmingly negative. This has united all of Scotland's musical community in condemnation, and already three different and distinct petitions exist in order to have these programmes restored and put to the right places and to ensure that they continue to be a feature of BBC Scotland scheduling. And I've just heard, heard even in the last few minutes, that they've got a combined collection of 20,997 signatures, such is the interest in, about these and the desire to see these programmes saved. And the head of jazz at the Conservatoire in Scotland, Tommy Smith, has coordinated an open letter, which he sent, I think, to the minister, as well as representatives of ministers in the Scottish government. And that letter is signed by the cream of Scotland's cultural voice. People like Nicola Benedetti, who's responsible for the delivery of the Edinburgh Festival. Sir James McMillan, one of Scotland's prime composers. Our macker, national macker, has signed it. Scottish Opera has signed it, and of course various luminaries from the jazz world all have voiced their concerns about what will happen when, if these programmes are taken off. And what this letter rightly notes is that this decision comes at an extremely difficult time for all areas of the culture and creative industries. And I don't think I need to say that to the Minister because she's more than aware of the specific and distinct challenges that everybody in the cultural sector are experiencing just now. The pressure on the music industry is acute. And I think what this letter said is that we must do everything we can to protect that infrastructure that supports a fragile but world-leading Scottish cultural ecosystem. But more than that, what comes across in this letter is passion. Passion about the music that these programmes support. Passion from those that assemble these programmes and put it together, the broadcasters that present it, and the audiences that lap this up and love every minute. And I'll quote from one of the signatories of the letter, who also said in her own words, and this is Nicola Benedetti from Edinburgh Festival, axing these programmes is to perform a heartbreaking disservice to the irreplaceable role they have played in the lives of musicians and music lovers across the country and all parts of society. And she is spot on. I think what this chorus of disapproval underlines is just how much support there is in our small nation, a nation that exceeds way beyond its numbers in every sphere of cultural activity, which is internationally renowned and a brand that is known is something that we feel is important. And what comes across for this is that there is a real sense that we in Scotland will do everything we can to defend and protect our cultural output, and it recognises the distinctive flavour of all different and distinct parts. Of course, not going to be too Thank you, for giving me congratulating on securing this incredibly important debate. And isn't a, a fantastic example of how uh, Scotland's cultural uh, music scene can be uh, shared with the entire world is the, the Celtic Connections Festival that we're right in the middle of now, celebrating its 30th year and been a real forum for nurturing precisely uh, the kind of bands and precisely the different kinds of genres that he talks about and bringing them to a wider audience, helping not just people in Scotland but around the world understand and explore the whole range of music uh, that, that, that can be connected through a, fe a festival like that. Absolutely, and my honourable friend is quite right to mention the example of Celtic Connection because they don't come better than that. I, I remember back in 1993 when this all kicked off, it was a few concerts in the Concert Hall in Glasgow. It's now practically every venue in central Glasgow, and it goes on for, I think it's 10 days. And of course, I've got the great pleasure, as my honourable friend has, for attending a performance on Friday evening, and I think we're all looking forward to that. I think he'll probably have better luck than me to catch tickets for the club activities <laughs> in the evening, but we'll see how that all ends up, but I'm looking forward to that. And it is a great example of how smaller uh, niche um, mu music is supported. And it's not smaller anymore because of the support that it's been given over the course of the years. But I want to come to jazz in particular, because I think this is important. Jazz nights, come, the cutting of jazz nights comes at a time when Scottish jazz is rarely doing so well. Jazz has flourished in Scotland in recent years, and our emerging artists have started to gain national and international recognition. One of these, of course, is the wonderful Fergus McCready, who won the Scottish Album of the Year and was nominated for a Mercury Award in the last session of Mercury Prizes. Now, I don't know if the Ministers had an opportunity to listen to Forest Floor 
by Fergus McCready. I know that she'll now be rushing to stream this in the course of the evening because it's a wonderful example of virtuosity, combining a number of different genres and discipline, and it's a wonderful piece of work. And he's only in his 20s, but I mention him because he's a great example of what Jazz Nights did, and he got his first break on that. They supported him, sustained, played his music, and now he's in the point of embarking upon an international career. That's the type of thing that they should be doing. And we've also got to recognise that Edinburgh is the home of the international festivals, particularly the Jazz Festival. And Edinburgh is becoming increasingly renowned as a European, if not world centre, for classical music, where the wonderful facilities of the redeveloped Usher Hall. It's a great place to go and watch classical music. And again, if I'm the minister look for recommendations, go there someday to see some of the wonderful concerts that it's on. Will you give one? Yes, of course, I'll give it to wonderful friend. Um, he's straight too far into Glasgow for my liking. <laughs> uh, but would he uh, agree with me that the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, uh, based on my Glasgow Central constituency, is a huge part of this, this flourishing scene with classical, with jazz, with pipe music as well, and that there is no collaboration between these three. But the big key to this is for those young people to be able to hear their music on the radio and reach that wider audience, because that is not going to be picked up by the commercial stations. The BBC has a key role here in identifying that young talent, promoting that young talent, and it is from there that they can go on to great success. And, and again, my honourable friend is absolutely correct in her assessment and description of the wonderful works that goes on in the, Royal, in the Conservatoire in Scotland. And it's got a fantastic staff. And I've not had an opportunity to visit for a while, so she's got that me down the list now. I'll definitely go and see that. And I note the comments of John Wallace, who was the distinguished former head and leader of the Conservatoire in Glasgow, where he said, what's the point if they're cutting all these programmes? And he's right to make that point. And I think this is why we have to ensure that these young artists get to hear themselves on these radios. But what I was going to say is that when we want to hear these genres of music, it's naturally to the BBC that we turn. And it's the BBC that remains the dominant force in UK broadcasting because of its distinctive funding arrangement, because of the late licence fee, it allows it to do things that no other operator can do. And, you know, I think it's something that we turn to in order to try and secure and to find the things that we want. And even with all the competition, the increased competition that we've seen over the course of the years, the BBC still accounts for 47% of all radio consumption. And this privileged position means that it's especially important that BBC Radio provide value and programmes which are distinctive. And the BBC has statutory responsibilities and obligations when it comes to this. And of course, Ofcom's there to ensure that the BBC does this. And there's very clear commitments that are supposed to be met by the BBC when it comes to ensuring that all genres of music are there and that they're serving an audience that's beyond the mainstream. That's what the BBC is supposed to be there to do. But instead, what we've seen, Mr Hendrick, is a a reduction in important public value obligations and a loss of that distinctiveness. Now, Ofcom is currently consulting, and I know it's, we're expecting it to produce its final proposals following its consultation in a few months' time with a new operating licence coming into effect from April. And this is happening when the DCMS is having its mid-term review, the BBC, and of course... We've got the white paper that we're all expecting with great anticipation and the Minister and I discussed at length when she appeared at the Scottish Affairs Committee. So there are lots of things going on. But my plea to the Minister is, with all this activity, with all these reviews that's happening, don't lose sight of prime objective of serving all audiences and ensuring that everybody has something that they can listen to. It's so tempting just to play to the mainstream, to appeal to where the mass audience is. And we should not lose sight of ensuring that everybody is serviced when it comes to this. And let's look at the BBC's obligations and responsibilities as outlined by Ofcom. It says that the BBC should ensure a range of programming that are provided across all its services, and specifically on radio services. It says the BBC should ensure its portfolio of stations offer the broadest variety of output and that the range of musical output on its popular radio services is broader than that of comparable providers. The BBC's decision to cut jazz, classical and piping programme will vastly reduce that commitment. And how the BBC represents and platforms some of Scotland's most dynamic and emerging music scenes. 
It's clearly a breach of what's set out in Charter and Regulation. And I hope that the Minister will remind BBC Scotland of its obligations and responsibilities. And in response to the chorus of disapproval, the BBC, of course, have got in touch with all of us about all of this. And I know my honourable friend was at a meeting with the BBC um, last Friday, I believe it was, and she heard some of the alternative proposals they put forward. I think none of what's been suggested comes close to beating the, the satisfaction that there is in the sense of loss from these programmes. And what it seems to me in looking at what the BBC is proposing is a series of amalgamations of taking these programmes off spectrum, putting them online, and then diverting people to other services. That's simply not good enough. It doesn't even start to address what is being lost. Now, my appeal to the BBC is to listen to those involved in the front line of that. Those at that meeting that my honourable friend was at, they are the people who know the genres, who know how they work, know how they operate, know what they require in order to survive, to sustain and to develop. And if anything the Minister could do would be to encourage the BBC to engage positively with this. The BBC has engaged positively in the past, and I know the people in BBC Scotland, they're good guys, and I believe they've got the best interests of our nation and they want to serve these audiences they just need the encouragement to do the right thing and to make sure that these services are safe i'll end mr hendrick by saying that this is a hard time to be a musician i would hate it to be a musician during this particular period i was in the 80s and 90s when it was the days of bounty and it was an entirely different regime now streaming accounts means that musicians will earn very little from the recorders work we've got We've got the effects of the pandemic. We've got a cost of living. I think I saw a survey which showed that over 90% of musicians are now concerned about the impact of the cost of living crisis and their ability to perform. We had the report yesterday about the loss of venues and clubs, which has restricted live performance. There's the impacts of Brexit. Europe's practically closed to new artists with all the different paperwork that's required in order to do this. This is not a good time. We do not need these difficulties compounded with a loss of an opportunity to be played on the radio. We may not get all the right notes in the right order as specified by our good friend, the great late um, Eric Morecambe. But I hope that we can bring some sort of support to the sector that we can encourage people to think again and look at what they're doing and the damage that this might actually bring to these sectors. And I hope the Minister does all she can in order to make sure that people are aware of the responsibilities and obligations and they think again about the damage this is doing to these sectors. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And there is a possibility of a division fairly shortly, but I will apply any injury time to the delay that's taken uh, due to the vote. Okay, Minister Lopez. Thank you, yours. Sir Mark. It's a pleasure, oh, sir. Sorry, the question is oh. that this House has for smaller musical genres, genres in Scotland. Minister. Thank you, Sir Mark. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I do hope that we are uh, not interrupted by votes. And I thank the Honourable Gentleman for Perth and North Perthshire for calling this debate and also for our exchanges last week as part of his committee's examination of broadcasting in Scotland. I look forward to receiving his recommendations and ideas about the best approach. He talks of sonorous chaos in his beautiful speech, and it makes me think about the behaviour of the SNP at BMQs every Wednesday. Um, I absolutely agree with him about the importance of music. He spoke beautifully about that. Scotland has such a rich and vibrant cultural heritage, and today I have the pleasure of speaking to that, uh, which I know that music is at the core of Scottish identity, but also British identity. I, as he was speaking, I was thinking back to the Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II's uh, state funeral, which was opened by a, a band of, of pipers, which was you know, extremely moving, and then closed uh, with a lone piper uh, in Windsor. And I think that is some, an image and a sound and a, a thing of beauty that is stuck in, in many of our minds and, and will be a, a noted internationally as something that is both a very strong cultural identity but something that is also able to move the human soul. Uh, certainly. You spoke about the importance of piping, uh, both here and, and internationally. Is she aware that really there is, there is no back catalogue of a lot of piping because it's live, and that the pipeline programme is in effect the back catalogue of the nation's piping, and th this is why it is so important? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your intervention. I was not aware of that, and I know how strongly people feel about pipeline. I suspect the BBC has been surprised by um, the strength of feeling uh, that has been... Uh, expressed not just in relation to these particular programmes, but also some of the local radio changes that have been proposed uh, uh, by the organisation. 
music is an absolutely essential part of our arts and cultural sector, but of course it's also a big business, and pre-pandemic that sector was worth about £5.8 billion pounds and exported music and services worth £2.9 billion. Pounds. I think we're all familiar with just how, how many UK artists uh, make such waves internationally. As well as few ten, tens of thousands of jobs, it's a huge source of soft power on the world stage. And Scotland's music ecosystem, of course, forms a valuable component of that, having produced a wealth of internationally renowned artists, including Lewis Capaldi, Annie Lennox, and Calvin Harris. But I would it be wrong of me uh, not to mention the Honourable Member himself, who I believe was the first representative of the House of Commons to have appeared on Top of the Pops. I'm also told he sold something in the region of a million records, which I don't know whether he can verify or not. But I, I, had, I have confessed... I had no idea that Gaelic folk rock, while seemingly niche, has such a broad uh, and dedicated audience. And of course, his crowning glory is being a member of MP4. Uh, traditional Scottish music is internationally recognised as the sound of Scotland, but it's also recognised for its richness and diversity that spans and often blends an array of musical genres and styles. And he mentioned uh, jazz and the, uh, the burgeoning scene, particularly around Edinburgh. And I agree with him that it's crucial that that music is preserved and may, remains as culturally relevant today as it has done in the past. Now, of course, radio and television are fantastic ways to celebrate culture, and the BBC has played a really important role in audio and visual content across the UK. And we believe, as a government, it's essential that the BBC continues to reflect, re represent, and serve the diverse community, uh, communities across the entire uh, country, including in Scotland. And I recognise that audiences value BBC Scotland showcasing all genres of musical talent that that nation has to offer. And he has raised uh, some, some profound concerns about changes to Pipeline, to Classics Unwrapped, and to Jazz Nights. And I say, I, I'm glad that the BBC is aware of that strength of feeling, and I would recommend that uh, honourable members continue to make uh, that strength of feeling known. Because, as you know, the BBC is independent of, of government, and therefore it makes its own decisions. And whilst it's influenced by the funding envelope that it receives, uh, my understanding about a lot of these radio changes is that they are funding neutral is part of a drive towards a digital first model for the BBC um, and so I think it's important that we in this house continue to express uh, what we're hearing from our constituencies about those services that are valued the most they may not have the largest audiences but they actually have a profound meaning in a lot of people's lives, they serve particular pockets of culture uh, that are important to our national identity and uh, I, as I would <coughs> recommend that he continues to uh, liaise with the BBC and make uh, clear that level of opinion and, and that level of feedback Feeling. We believe it's uh, important to, that the BBC continues to cultivate those partnerships that have made it such an important uh, mechanism for, um, uh, for making sure that local musicians uh, can get an audience. Um, and last year, the BBC extended its partnerships with Creative Scotland to December 2024. It's also renewing its collaboration agreement with MG Alba, whom I spoke to very recently. And it's been uh, working with the Scottish Government and others to deliver Speak Gaelic, a suite of resources, including website, podcasts, and radio and TV programmes to support learners. But talent must start somewhere, and it has to be nurtured. And musicians, particularly those practising in lesser-known uh, genres, have to be afforded a platform so that they can excel in the music industry and reach their potential. And in response to concerns that have been expressed by honourable members, uh, they've set out some of the things they are doing to support emerging uh, musical talents, such as BBC Introducing in Scotland and the BBC Radio Scotland Young Traditional Musician of the Year Awards. And I would urge the BBC to consider how its changes will impact its deliver ability to deliver for audiences across our country. As uh, the honourable gentleman mentioned, it's a requirement of the Charter and it's important that Ofcom holds it to account for its delivery in that regard. Uh, he raises a number of other issues in relation to the music industry, which I'm very alive to, and we're drawing up a strategy in our creative sector vision, which will touch upon some of these issues. He raised the issue of streaming, which I know that the DCMS Select Committee has been looking at in great detail. Uh, the Competition and Markets Authority has, has looked at this extensively. It's also an issue being looked at by the uh, intellect, Intellectual uh, Property Office, and it's something that we will be coming forward uh, with further work streams uh, in, in the coming weeks and months. Um, we also do a lot of work in relation to music export. I think there's always more we can do in this regard, but we work closely with the Department of International Trade on the Music Export Growth Scheme, which is helping to break new artists into other markets, and that includes the Scottish singer-songwriter Nina Nesbitt. And I'll be continuing to work closely with DIT on these kinds of initiatives. Um, as he knows, uh, a lot of culture uh, is devolved, 
and therefore spending on arts and culture in Scotland is mainly carried out by the Scottish Government. I know that he has taken up some of his concerns uh, with Angus Robertson and it's for him to uh, decide how to allocate some of that cultural spend and it may be that they wishes to look at some of the programmes in relation to the musical genres that he talks about. We're always keen to work collaboratively uh, with them. Um, the uh, UK creative industries are one of the fastest growing sectors in the UK and therefore, as, as I mentioned, we are drawing up this creative sector vision which is going to look at a whole range of ways in which we can make sure that that uh, sector continues to thrive and that includes looking at creative clusters across the UK and Dundee in particular is a great cluster for video gaming, uh, looking at some of the skills that are required for the workforce but also looking at some of these issues that he has highlighted in his uh, very uh, good speech. And of course, uh, we also support culture in a range of ways, including through the Cultural Recovery Fund, which obviously is devolved in the Scottish context. But in relation to music venues, which he raised, it has been a time of profound challenge with pandemic, uh, closing a number of venues, but also leading to a reluctance from audiences to go back into uh, venues, but also in terms of the cost of living pressures that are on households and making it uh, an item of expenditure that many people feel they can cut out. And we're trying to support venues uh, mainly through the energy uh, the energy support scheme, uh, which will be continuing in a slightly different form from April uh, of this year. Um, but I, I would like to conclude, if I may, by just saying thank you, uh, thank you to the Honourable Gentleman for raising uh, his concerns with such passion, uh, with such, um, in, in a sense, with such beauty. Um, you know, music is a profoundly important thing for us all. It serves us in many different purposes through life, guides us as a as a companion through our journeys in life, and. Uh, particularly when it comes to Scotland, uh, it has a, a very important heritage aspect and something that people value very much. So I do hope that the BBC is listening uh, to his concerns, is alive to what people, uh, honourable members in this House, are talking about in relation to radio cuts. And it's something that I wish to continue to raise with them in my regular meetings with the uh, Director General. Thank you, Minister. The question is that this House has considered government support for smaller musical genre in Scotland. As many as are of that opinion say aye. To, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order.